Thank you very much, John. Um, and good evening, everyone. Thank you very much um, for joining us. So I shall find my talk. Okay, so um, yeah, so I'm going to talk for about the next 50 minutes on the reintroduction of white-tailed eagles to England. Um, and then at the end, as John's just alluded to, there is um, a bit of time for questions. So if you've got any, if any burning questions crop up during the course of the talk, just whack your question in the Q&A and um, I'll do my best to answer them at the end. Anyway, um, without further ado, the White-tailed Eagle um, Reintroduction Project is a partnership between the Roy Dennis Wildlife Foundation and Forestry England. Um, and basically my talk tonight is going to focus on a bit of background, a bit of background to the history of the this iconic bird in Britain, um, the efforts that have been made to restore it to Scotland, and specifically what's happened with the Isle of Wight project since we started in 2019. Um, and as you'll see, there's a bit of Yorkshire in the talk as well. I thought better make sure that was the case. Anyway, so a bit of background first. So the white-tailed eagle, um, if any of you have seen one, then you'll know what I mean. Um, they really are flying barn doors. They're the fourth largest eagle in the world, um, associated as the sea eagle name suggests with sea coasts, but also large inland waters. So there's big populations around the inland lakes in places like Germany um, and Poland. They've got this huge 2.5 meter wingspan, but I don't think it's just the wingspan, it's the, the broadness of the wings that just gives them, give them such a characteristic and enormous um, flight silhouette. Um, and females particularly are very large. So females can weigh in excess of seven kilograms. Males are more like four and a half to five kilograms, but both are big birds, but you can see a size difference if you're lucky enough to see a male and female next to each other. And of course, it's the adult birds that have that distinctive white tail. So white-tailed eagle or juvenile white-tailed eagle start off with this dark brown plumage and then slowly but surely over the course of four to five years, they molt into that full adult plumage with the distinctive white tail. So, um, you know, if you're, if you're lucky enough to see an adult white-tailed eagle, they are a really, really distinctive um, and special bird. Anyway, this is the current distribution of the species um, around the world and particularly in Europe. So the species itself ranges from Greenland to Northern Japan. Um, there are certain strongholds. So there are strongholds in Russia, and also, also northern parts of Europe. But like many birds of prey, its range is restricted compared to historical times. So this is a bird that we know formerly bred from the Arctic Circle right down to North Africa. So there are still big areas that don't have breeding white-tailed eagles, despite the fact that in many places the population is now expanding. Um, and in view of that, the, the English government included the reintroduction of white-tailed eagles in the 25-year environment plan, which is really where the Isle of Wight project fits into all this. So it's a really proactive means of restoring this bird to back to England again, after an absence of about 240 years, as I'll come on to in a while. Anyway, just some basic facts about white-tailed eagles to begin with. Um, they're a generalist predator. They're an apex predator. They're at the top of the food chain but their diet does vary both seasonally and spatially in the landscape. And basically they're looking for whatever is most seasonally abundant. So quite often what will happen is that in spring and summer fish, whether they be marine um, or freshwater fish are, are normally favored during the spring and summer months. Whereas birds and mammals are more likely to be taken in autumn and winter. We also know that um, carrion is very important. So for example, there was a study in Germany they showed that carrion constitutes about 30% of the diet in winter. So this is a bird that potentially has a big range because it can exploit a range of different habitats. But typically when they're breeding, they want to be close to water because, of course, fish is such a protein rich diet. Um, and so when they're breeding, they tend to be within about two and a half kilometers of some kind of water, whether it be fresh water or salt water. Um, the other thing that they're, they're able to do, and um, I saw some brilliant footage, I think from the Isle of Mull recently, of a, of a seagull trying to steal a fish from an otter, and that's pretty typical. So they'll, they'll steal fish from um, gulls, otters. We've also seen them on the Isle of Wight taking food from marsh harriers. Um, so they're real kind of pirates in that regard. 
Um, and that's just one of the ways that they that they take their or, or get their food. Anyway, I think it's fair to say that in Britain, we kind of think of birds like white-tailed eagles as birds of really remote wild places. You think of them nesting on cliffs on the west coast of Scotland. But actually, if you look across their range within Europe, it's a bird that actually can inhabit a range of different habitats and actually tree nests are preferred. So where there are suitable trees, that's where they'll typically choose to, to breed. Um, and basically they'll breed in whatever tree is available as long as it's of a certain size. So for example, around the Danube Delta where there's a good population of white-tailed eagles, there they typically use uh, willow and also white poplar around about a height of 16 to 19 meters. Whereas in Scotland, um, they can use birch, oak, Scots pine, and some nests can be surprisingly low and even on isolated trees. So they don't necessarily need to be in the middle of a wood. Um, isolated trees are often used. And in places like Poland, where there's now a really strong population, something like 1500 pairs, they'll often just nest in an isolated tree on the edge of, edge of a flood meadow, somewhere like that. So they're, they're pretty highly adaptable. And that means that they will readily breed close to human settlements in continental Europe. So there's breeding white-tailed eagles near the center of Helsinki, on the outskirts of Rotterdam, the outskirts of Hamburg. So this is a bird that lives alongside people. All they do need is relative quiet around the immediate vicinity of the nest because they are prone to disturbance, um, you know, if it's at a crucial stage of the breeding season. And when it comes to breeding, they typically raise one or two young a year. They can rear three, but that's exceptional. So one or two is more typical. Now, historically speaking, in the UK, we know from historical research, that this is a bird that was basically widespread across the whole of the country. So if you look at research into geographical place names, interpreters identify identi identi sorry, indicating the presence of white-tailed eagles, and then also archaeological records, then what you get is, a, is quite a broad geographical spread. And the population was thought to be as high as 1,500 pairs. But as with many birds of prey, this is a species that was relentlessly persecuted. And just like the, the osprey, because this was a bird that was known to take fish, uh, we think that persecution was particularly a problem um, when Britain was Catholic and fish, of course, was very important on Fridays because birds like ospreys and white-tailed eagles were seen as direct competitors to that fish. So we think that was one of the driving forces behind their eradication. But um, slowly but surely, they were eradicated from England. Um, the last pair in southern England was on the Isle of Wight in um, 1780. Um, and slowly but surely, the range retracted and eventually they completely disappeared. So there was a period of time when there were no breeding white-tailed eagles in, in the UK at all. However, fortunately, um, in the 1960s, um, there were some very um, proactive and forward-thinking conservationists around. And one of them was George Waterston, who was head of the RSPB in Scotland at the time. And he was very much of the opinion that you shouldn't just conserve the nature you've got, but you should actively restore it. So he was really ahead of his time in that regard. Um, but in 1968, when Roy Dennis was warden of Fair Isle Bird Observatory, Waterson got permission to move four young white-tailed eagles from Norway, where there's a real stronghold of breeding white-tailed eagles, and rear and then release them on Fair Isle and Roy was basically charged with looking after those four birds and this was real pioneering stuff because now reintroduction is really part and parcel of conservation but in those days this was this was really really groundbreaking work and they released the four birds and then the following spring they dispersed as we now know white-tailed eagles do um, and none of them were definitely seen back so it couldn't be regarded as a success in that regard, but what it did do is it was the precursor to the larger scale um, reintroductions that took place on Rum National Nature Reserve between 75 and 85, and then at Loch Marie on the mainland coast between 93 and 98. And it was those releases that really restored a population of white-tailed eagles to the west coast of Scotland. Uh, in addition, a further 85 Norwegian eagles were released in Fife between 2007 and 2012 to facilitate the expansion of the population to eastern Scotland as well and we now know that it has been tremendously successful so there are now probably somewhere in the region of 150 
breeding pairs and they're just dis widely distributed across Scotland right up along about 200 miles of the west coast and also some isolated pairs further east so the future for white-tailed eagles in Scotland is looking good and of course I'm sure there are many of you listening to the talk this evening who may have been up to western Scotland in the hope that you might catch a glimpse of white-tailed eagles golden eagles well, we know that the presence of sea eagles on the Isle of Mull alone generates somewhere in the region of 5 million to the local economy every year and around 2.4 million to the Isle of Skye. So this is a bird that in that sense is absolutely integral to the um, rural livelihoods in that part of Scotland, which I think is a very important um, and powerful thing. Of course, there are controversies with white-tailed eagles in Western Scotland, and I'm not gonna go into that too much now, but I'll just touch on it in a minute. Um, but in, in following the successes in Scotland, a similar project took place in Ireland. So between, between 2007 and 2012, 100 white-tailed eagle chicks were transported from Norway to Killarney National Park in southwest Ireland. And there are now nine to ten breeding pairs. And really significantly, last year, there was the first wild-fledged chick. So that was the first real indication that the population was becoming self-sustaining. And I think one of the really important elements of the Irish project is that their engagement with stakeholders who might be regarded as antagonistic was excellent from the start. And what's happened is that when the project was first proposed, there, were, um, there was real opposition from the farming community. In particular, there were protests at the airport when the first birds arrived, but those attitudes have changed. And now there are farmers who are helping to monitor breeding white-tailed eagles on their land. So that's a real, a real success story. And I think it shows that this is a bird that can live alongside people, you know, in harmony with existing land users. And that was something that we also understood when we went across to the Netherlands, because in 2018, myself and Roy Dennis were really thinking about how we might revisit the idea of an English white-tailed eagle reintroduction, because you might know that in sort of, the late 2000s, 2007, 2008, there was a project proposed in East Anglia, which eventually didn't happen. But Roy was involved at that stage and he's always felt that this was a bird that we should restore to Southern England. And we felt that with the population expanding in Europe and you know, occasional birds coming across from the continent, now was the time to really push forward and try and do it again. So we went across to the Netherlands to look at how white-tailed eagles are living there in a, in a landscape that's much more similar to Southern England than say the west coast of Scotland. Um, there's around 20 breeding pairs in the Netherlands, but also a big pool of, of non-breeders because white-tailed eagles don't breed till they're four or five years old. You do tend to get a population that's quite big, but they're not all necessarily um, breeding. But it provided a really good example of how they do nest in lowland areas close to people. So this photo, just as an example, was taken basically from the hard shoulder of a motorway. This is just to the south of Rotterdam. And you can just about see there um, on the island a white-tailed eagle nest that's used every year. This is a site called Kramer Volkerak, south of Rotterdam. And it, it's a it was an important example for us because the assemblage of species that occur at that site are very similar to some of the places we were considering for a reintroduction on the south coast of England. And the Dutch had done some really good studies on the diet of those breeding birds. And what they find is that they predominantly take water birds. That's about 50%, 58% of the diet and fish constitute 28%. Um, but again, there was evidence that fish are the preferred prey source when they're available. And when it came to, to birds, then grey lag goose and coot were the most frequently caught water birds. And the, the grey lag geese principally related to um, gosling grey lag geese. Um, and also they will occasionally take adult birds, but only really if they're sick or injured, because clearly a, an adult grey lag goose is a big bird to, um, to try and take, despite the size of a white-tailed eagle. So they'll tend to concentrate on sick or um, injured individuals. And one of the key things really to note, not just in the Netherlands, but across the whole of Europe really, is that there is no conflict with sheep or livestock farming um, as is reported in Scotland. And I think that in areas where you've got really good natural, natural prey, this is a species that definitely lives in harmony with, with people. So we, we basically, the trip to the Netherlands was really valuable. It helped to inform 
some of the work we were doing for a feasibility study looking at a potential reintroduction on the south coast of England we felt that the Isle of Wight was the most suitable place not just because it was the last place they bred in 1780 but because strategically on the south coast that's a really good location it will facilitate expansion east and west along the coast we know that the estuaries around the Isle of Wight and the immediate area along the south coast have really good supplies of fish like grey mullet which are particularly important for white-tailed eagles um, and we knew from the work we did that there was plenty of breeding habitat so really the area lended itself to to a potential reintroduction um, of course though you can only go ahead with any kind of reintroduction once you've done a public consultation to really understand local views and we got a lot of local support but it was important to recognize that there was the expected opposition as well and we really felt it was very important from the outset to try and engage with those stakeholders who were you know more concerned about the proposals and we set up a steering group that included a whole remit of local stakeholders so conservationists but also um, councillors tourism people farmers sheep farmers um, and game shooting interests and that was really to make sure that everyone was represented everyone felt they had a voice in the project so after um, fairly lengthy consultations and the feasibility study, eventually Natural England and Scottish Natural Heritage, Nature Scott as they now are, um, issued licenses um, to begin a project in 2019. And um, the initial license is to release up to 60 birds over the course of five summers, so 12 birds every year. Um, basically, um, the population modelling we did suggested that this would be sufficient to establish an initial population of um, six to eight pairs which would likely be within 50 kilometers of the release site that's the typical natal dispersal of um, breeding white-tailed eagles from the place they regard as home and I think one of the things that you you know you might consider is some of the people who were more antagonistic of the project immediately felt well 60 birds means 30 pairs and they're all going to nest on the Isle of Wight of course that's not the case because survival of a bird like white-tailed eagle is actually relatively low probably only 30 to 40 percent would survive to breeding age which as i say is four to five years and the natal dispersal is up to 50 kilometers so what we thought is that there might be two or three pairs on the isle of Wight, then other key areas along the south coast so sites like paul harbour perhaps the Arran valley in uh, west sussex um, and other estuarine sites dotted along the south coast and that was certainly, um, you know, our, our, our key aim. Um, so we got the permission to begin the project in 2019. And the first six juveniles were translocated um, in late June that, that year and then released in August. And subsequently released another seven birds in 2020 and 12 this last year. So how exactly do you go about um, translocating white-tailed eagles? Well, um, the first thing to say is that the nests in Scotland are, are monitored by members of the Scottish Raptor Study Group and we've had some really great support from some of the people um, like Robin Reed, Justin Grant who help, who really do a huge amount of work to understand how the birds are doing in Scotland and we've also got two really invaluable colleagues Ian Perks and Fraser Cormack who are fantastic tree climbers um, and around the time of collection um, Fraser and Ian will go up into the trees um, and assess birds that we may or may not be able to collect. So this is Fraser climbing up to a nest on the west coast. And the site that Fraser is met with when he gets to the top of the tree is this. So this uh, two white-tailed eagle chicks there, they're about seven to eight, eight weeks old, which is a really good age to translocate them. Um, at that age there, about three quarters grown they're able to feed themselves um, but they're not too much of a handful <laughs> they are a big bird still but they're able to um, be translocated without too much stress for the birds because they're not flapping around too much um, but as you can see from this video you've really got to know what you're doing when you get up to the top of the nest so all the people involved in this um, in this project are acting on this under this special license which is issued from um, nature scott to collect one brood from a bird of a brood one bird from a brood of um, two or three 
And the bird on the right there, you can just about make out the ring number G324. That is a bird I'm going to talk about um, in a while. And there we go. There's Fraser coming back down from the nest with a young white-tailed eagle. Now, after the requisite number have been collected, then we've been really fortunate. And there's a, a, a friendly pilot, Graham Mountford, who does some volunteering for Civil Air Patrol. And they very kindly agreed to offer to help with the project. So Graham and his daughter Helen actually fly the bird south to the Isle of Wight for us, which of course hugely reduces um, transit time, it reduces stress for the birds and it makes the whole operation much more slick. So we're very, very grateful to Graham and Helen for the help they've given us so far. And the birds are moved down to the Isle of Wight and then they go into special aviaries, holding pens, where they're basically held for about six weeks and the pens as you can see there are large um, so we'll keep two or three birds together which really replicates the natural brood size and the key thing is that the the individual pens are kind of isolated units so the birds are not seeing other young that have been transicated they are in adjoining pens there's a solid wall and then really crucially there's a solid rear wall that means that when food is put in and food's put in twice, two or three times a day, and it's mainly locally sourced fish on the Isle of Wight, the white-tailed eagles are never seeing people. So we want to completely reduce any human contact so that those birds remain as wild, well, completely wild. They are completely wild birds when they're, when they're released. There's no human habituation whatsoever. Um, and the pens are big enough for them to kind of branch out from the nest as they would do naturally. And after about six weeks, then they're typically ready for release. And just prior to release, then we go into the pens, we catch each individual bird, which is easier said than done. And then we get them checked by this guy, John Chitty, who's a really experienced avian vet. Um, and we fit them all with satellite transmitters so that we can monitor their post-release movements. You can see there why the white-tailed eagle is called the flying barn door. That is a pretty hefty um, wing. Anyway, to release the birds, again, what we're always trying to do is replicate natural processes. So what we don't want to do is just flush the birds out. We want them to go of their own volition when they're ready. Now, I have to say that the two birds in this video actually go very quickly. So you can see the door is opening there. That's opened by a series of ropes, um, which mean that the door can be opened without any human contact again. And those two went quickly. But at the next video... Um, is a more typical release. This is really what we want to see. So you'll see there the door is open. The two birds are on the front of the open door. There's another one in the field adjacent to the release pens sitting quietly. And one of those birds on the open door, which hadn't flown up to this point, sees the other bird and just flies across to it. And that is not very spectacular, but that's exactly what we want to happen because that is the safest way those young birds can fledge. Anyway, once they've been released, then really the project team replicate the behavior of adult white-tailed eagles who have got dependent young. So we continue to provide food, or the project officer, I should say, is Steve Egerton Reed, who's based down on the Isle of Wight. And Steve um, and one or two people who help him will go out and put food out ev probably every other day on elevated platforms right next to where the release pens are in a quiet um, confidential location on the Isle of Wight and that means that the birds can come and feed for as long as they want to through the autumn and then into the early winter. So again we typically feed them fish, mainly fish, um, after release and what's great is that this gives them a really good start. So I mean this is two birds a few weeks ago. See there's a big um, or a couple of magpies um, pinching some food as well but it really does is useful for scale to see just how big the the eagles are and what's been really pleasing about this year is that the birds have continued to come and feed and in fact they're still going back to the release site even now so what that means is that they're start, starting to disperse further into the landscape they're learning where they are in the world but they're coming back to food feed on the food provided by the project team and you're guaranteeing then that they're eating the best quality food and they're in really good condition going into their first winter, which is when a lot of mortality can occur. So this should really reduce mortality in the first winter. Um, and as I say, um, in the first year, we released six birds, four males and two females. 
Second year, it was seven, four males and three females. And then this year, because we were, you know, much more confident about how things were going, we decided it was sensible to move a larger number of birds or we felt we could do it. And we wanted to redress the balance into the sex ratio, which was skewed in favor of males initially. So we moved more females. So four males and eight females and all was successfully released. And as I say, um, you know, our initial aim is that a, a population of six to eight pairs will become established in that kind of core area. So you're talking about 50 kilometers from the release site on the Isle of Wight. So that takes in places like Pool Harbour in Dorset um, and also the New Forest. So that's where we think the initial pairs will settle. But of course, what we've learned from the satellite tracking um, and what was known to a certain extent with white-tailed eagle is that although as the birds approach breeding age, they will come back to this core natal area and that's where they'll probably establish breeding territories. For the first probably two, maybe even three years, they're going to be much more nomadic. And the satellite tracking has given us such a valuable insight into those movements. So. Um, I'm going to focus really on three of the birds that we released in 2019 because they really do um, illustrate very well what's happened with the project to date and what we're really learning so far. So G393 um, was translocated from the Isle of Mull in 2019, was actually the first bird to fly in that first year. And you'll see here that this one has, you know, explored extensively around England over the last um, two years. So between the 8th of September 2019, when he left the Isle of Wight for the first time, the 8th of February this year, when he returned um, after 17 months away, he covered nearly 5,000 kilometers around England. And in that time, the tag on his back logged 71,036 GPS points. That just gives you such a, a good example of this kind of data that we're able to collect with these transmitters. And you'll see there that there are a few key areas that that bird has visited. And I just wanna talk about some of them because it really shows you a kind of progression and how that bird has started to learn to live successfully in the English landscape. So in his first winter, he spent much of his time on a flooded river valley on the Oxfordshire, Buckinghamshire border. So a nice area, but nothing particularly spectacular really big populations of red kites. And we know that carrion is really important for white-tailed eagles in their first year in particular. So there's no doubt that the presence of kites in that area was a help to that bird because it would use the kites to find carrion in the landscape. And because the satellite tracking data is so detailed, obviously we can check out um, the roost sites the bird is using. Um, and we can then start to piece together what the bird is eating through prey remains and pellets and so in March of that year so March 2020 last year we did um, made a few visits to check the roost site and we found um, remains of or a lot of rabbit fur in the prey remains and rabbits have been a really key prey item for probably all the birds since release um, but then also um, evidence of other species that we expected the eagles to take so gulls, mallards, pigeons, pheasants, and corvid feathers. And of course, what you don't know from this is whether those species have been taken live. I think the chances are many of them were scavenged dead, um, particularly game birds, which um, were fairly prevalent in the area. Um, White-tailed eagles are known to predate wild wildfowl, so maybe they did take some of the mallards live, but it, it clearly there's no way of being certain, but it gave a good indication of what that bird, how that bird was living. And after being relatively sedentary over that first winter, um, in mid-March last year, so when the bird was just going into its second calendar year, he began exploring widely across um, England. So in the space of six weeks, he covered just about a thousand miles. He flew up to um, into Herefordshire, then up to um, Staffordshire, across to Rutland Water, then up to Yorkshire, um, up to the North York Moors, back to the Peak District, then to the Suffolk coast, um, back to Cambridgeshire, to the Neem Washes, and then back up to the North York Moors. So that bird was really learning about England and really learning the best places for a white-tailed eagle to be. And then for a period of a couple of months, he settled in the North York Moors and we got um, there's a few local people who were really 
helpful in monitoring that bird and helping us to understand how it was living in the area because of course you've got all this fantastic satellite data but what you really need is people on the ground to to actually see the bird in the field now i have to say this coincided with that first coronavirus lockdown so um, monitoring was more difficult than usual but of course local people on their daily exercise walks were able to keep an eye on the bird which is really valuable and one of the areas that the bird favoured for nearly two months was this valley in the North York Moors and interestingly when you look at the data of this bird and another one that was in the North York Moors last summer um, they actually didn't spend very much time out on the open moors at all what they typically favoured were um, some of the lower valleys um, where you've got lots of trees there's high rabbit abundance and white-tailed eagles and I'll come on to this a bit later but they very much prefer the sit and wait method for finding food so they'll sit quietly in the landscape somewhere they'll watch what's going on and then they'll go and catch whatever prey they're targeting and of course that's a really good way to catch rabbit so what we've seen in many of the areas that the birds have settled if they've been in inland areas away from water like this one they're nearly always areas where there's really high rabbit abundance and that was the key prey item for g393 in the north york moors and in fact during june of last year he was joined by another female that had been released in 2019 and in fact a female he'd shared a pen with um, and they spent the whole of June together in this valley and we got some great photos of them together but then in um, it was kind of mid-July last year he flew south in the North York Moors G318 remained for longer so she spent five months in the area before then going down to uh, the Lincolnshire Wolds but G393 went south sooner and he flew across to the south and then into West Norfolk and then spent another four months in West Norfolk right through into the early part of this year and again his movements in West Norfolk were really interesting to follow and one of the places that he went to was the West Acre estate in West Norfolk and it was really fascinating to see that um, when I was looking on the satellite data the bird was going to this reservoir on an almost daily basis. So I managed to get in touch with the estate who were really, really supportive um, and went across and visited the estate with the, with the head forester there. And we checked all, the, all of the birds um, roosting locations and we also went to the reservoir. And what we found is that this area is actually surrounded by pig farms. And those pig farms attract in black-headed gulls. The black-headed gulls come to the reservoir to wash and to roost. And it was there that the bird was catching them because when we went to its various favoured perching places and roost sites, we found the remains of numerous black headed gulls. So that was the bird's key prey item in that part of West Norfolk. Um, it also flew out into the wash and it spent around about 60% of days um, um, flying out onto the mud flats of the wash um, from the 4th of November onwards. And so, you know, this bird was really learning how a white-tailed eagle will live in England. It was really, really fascinating to follow. But after these, you know, these kind of big initial exploratory flights and this initial dispersal, what we know from the um, evidence um, that's been gathered around Europe is that white-tailed eagles are so quite sight faithful. So although they do have this ability to disperse big distances, they'll typically return to their natal area as they start to think about approaching breeding age and so in February this year on the 7th of February this year G393 returned to the Isle of Wight and he's since spent all his time on the south coast and he's now establishing a territory around the Solent so that's really really important because what that's showing is that yes the birds will disperse away but they still regard the Isle of Wight as home. Now another bird that was released in 2019 that's behaved very differently is G274, so another male. And this is all of its movements since release. So you see there, totally different. It's spent nearly all its time on the Isle of Wight. It did three exploratory flights of about five to six days into Southeast England and one to Southwest England. But otherwise it stayed on the Isle of Wight. And that's been really useful because that has shown how those birds are likely to live um, when they're on the South Coast. And this bird has become a real specialist at catching fish. So he catches fish um, in the estuaries around the coast of the Isle of Wight, um, principally um, grey mullet during the spring and summer. Um, this photo is actually taken in winter and you can see there are some Brent geese in the foreground, oyster catcher, uh, I think that's a curlew as well. So 
What we're also seeing is how quickly the local wintering birds become habituated to the presence of white-tailed eagles. So they don't create much disturbance. They sit quietly in the estuaries on a post like that, and there's actually very little disturbance to the local wintering birds. But really to emphasize the fact that they will adapt their diet to whatever's most seasonally abundant, we were also really amazed to find that this bird has become a real specialist at catching cuttlefish, which come into the seagrass beds off the coast of the Isle of Wight to spawn during the summer. So in June and July 2020, and then again this last summer, this bird has caught numerous um, cuttlefish just offshore, which was a food item that we didn't actually factor into our initial feasibility study. So that's going to be something that's really positive as a, as a breeding population becomes established or we hope becomes established. But the other interesting thing about this bird is that it's continued to catch fish right the way through the year. So whereas we expected them to probably target fish during the spring and summer, this one has continued to catch fish right the way through the winter. So as an example, this is um, some satellite data from the south coast of the Isle of Wight near Black Gang Chine, for those of you who know the area. And um, between the 1st of November 2020 and the 5th of Jan uh, February 2021, um, it was regularly going out and fishing in the sea. In fact, on a third of days, whenever the weather was good, that bird was fishing out to sea. And interestingly, um, it would go quite a long way out sometimes. So it would go up to about four and a half kilometers is the maximum we recorded. And that's because on this um, coast of the Isle of Wight, you get big concentrations of um, bass at that time of year. And so the birds are actually going down and catching bass um, very co close to some of the fishermen who were targeting exactly the same fish. And we got some fantastic videos from some of these fishermen who were just really excited to see a white-tailed eagle diving down um, near their boat. And I hope in years to come, it might be possible for some of those fishermen to actually take people out to sea hunting white-tailed eagles, just like you can off the Isle of Mull and the Isle of Skye. So that was really, really excellent. And interestingly, we saw a very clear shift in that bird's behavior for, during its second winter compared to its first winter. First winter, it was very much um, feeding on carrion, but um, in its second winter, it was where, whenever possible, when the weather was good, it was going out to sea and it was catching fish. So a clear shift in its, in its diet. Now, the other bird is that I wanted to talk about is G324, which is actually the bird, if you remember, from the photo of the two young white-tailed eagles in a nest. So G324 was translocated from that nest in June 2019, translocated to the Isle of Wight, and she spent her first winter on the Isle of Wight, and then in May, end of May um, last year, flew up to Northumberland, and then up to the Lammermuir Hills, and she spent the whole of the summer or two months of the summer in the Lammermuirs and again she was favouring um, the lower slopes of the hills in areas where there were good numbers of rabbits. Um, this is a site I visited and there's a huge rabbit warren which was one of her favourite places to um, visit but after two months in the Lammermuir hills she went back to the Isle of Wight and she, since she returned to the Isle of Wight she has paired up with G274 so those two birds now spend really every minute of every day together. They're very, it's very unusual to see them apart. So we're really hopeful that they may, with a bit of luck, they might form the first breeding pair. Of course, it's very early days. They might not breed till they're four or five years old, but this is a really, really encouraging sign. So um, it's really encouraging to see how these, some of these birds have dispersed long distances away, but then they've returned to the Isle of Wight that they now regard as home. And as I say, G274 and G324 have favoured a coastal site on the Isle of Wight um, really for the most of this year, in fact all of this year, um, and seem to have established a territory there. So that is really, really good news. And as I say, G274 is catching mullet on a daily basis, but he's also going out to sea to catch fish um, there as well, because at this time of year you don't get the mullet in the estuaries in the same way, so they then switch to bass, which are um, found offshore. They'll also catch other things as well, like black-headed gulls, and I'll come on to that in a minute. But we're hopeful we might see the first breeding behaviour in the next 18 months or so. But clearly, I don't want to tempt fate. You know, all manner of things can go wrong, but the signs are encouraging. Anyway, um, what we're seeing now is that there is 
clear territorial behavior between the two males, 74 and 93. So that's exactly what we'd expect to see at this time of year. Um, but we're also seeing that the birds that we've released in later years are behaving in exactly the same way. So this is the 2020 cohort. So six birds which survived their first winter um, this spring did these amazing dispersal flights. So one went right up to the north coast of Scotland. Uh, another one spent the summer in the southern uplands in southern Scotland. Um, another bird has spent a good amount of time in West Norfolk. Um, but the really interesting one was um, G3, G, G463, got these um, colorings are not always easy to remember, but G463, a male who, um, after exploring East Anglia um, in the spring, he flew across the English Channel. So the first Isle of Wight bird to cross the Channel and went across to uh, France. He got up to an altitude of 1,363 meters over Dungeness and then basically headed out over the English Channel. Um, took four, 40 minutes to complete a 47 kilometer crossing to France and then basically spent the next seven months exploring over a really large part of, of continental Europe. So you can see there that spent time in the Netherlands, um, Germany, and also right up into Denmark. And he was visiting places that are real strongholds for white-tailed eagles. So we did wonder, would this be a bird that doesn't come back? Will it meet other white-tailed eagles and, and remain in continental Europe? But it was fascinating to see that despite the fact this bird was this photo was taken in the Netherlands, despite the fact it was in these areas that are really good habitat for white-tailed eagles. On three occasions between June uh, and October, it returned to the very location on the French coast that it had made landfall um, in April and was clearly waiting for the best weather in order to make the return crossing. And eventually, um, on the 10th of November this year, he went back across and again, picked the perfect day to do it. There was a, um, a south easterly wind, which gave a perfect um, tailwind. And he made a crossing to, from, from France to um, near, the, near Dover on the Kent coast in about 45 minutes. So again, a very, very similar crossing. And that was brilliant because again, despite the fact this bird has been visiting these areas where white-tailed eagles are increasingly common, where it was mixing with continental white-tailed eagles, it still felt the urge to come back to England. And hopefully it will eventually go back to the Isle of Wight. It's currently um, in Norfolk, in West Norfolk, in an area that it had visited in the spring. So there you go, that's its explorations through Europe. And it actually in that, in those, that track length there is 8,396 kilometers. So it really does show you how wide they will um, explore in their first year. So just to conclude, what, you know, what, what have we learned so far? So in terms of the diet in, in England and, well, also, I suppose you could say Scotland and continental Europe, um, what we're finding is that the key prey items are marine fish, so particularly grey mullet, European bass and black bream on the um, south coast. And these really encouragingly are taken year round. So it's not just spring and summer. They're actually able to catch fish year round. Um, as I mentioned, D274 learned to catch cuttlefish on, in the seagrass beds in the Solent. So that's probably something that other birds will learn to do as well. Um, Lagomorphs, so brown hare and rabbit have been really important. And whenever the birds are in inland areas, as they, as they quite often are, they're typically in areas where you've either got a high abundance of brown hares or a high abundance of rabbits. Um, Black-headed gulls are taken year round in various locations. Um, they'll also take water birds, so mallard and coot particularly, but also carrion. So carrion is really important. Um, they might be scavenger water birds, but also game birds, dead fish, washed up marine mammals. Um, and also corvids and wood pigeons appear in the, in the pellets regularly. So they're, you know, two regularly taken groups of um, species. And another thing that's been really revealing about the satellite tracking is, despite the fact the birds do do these incredible dispersal flights, um, they're also very, very sedentary. So on a, any given day, when the weather conditions are right, they might fly 100 miles. But on the vast majority of days, they'll just find a quiet location, might be on the coast, might be by a lake, might be in an inland area. But they'll find somewhere quiet to perch, and they'll probably spend about 90 to 93% of the day perched. And we know that from the, because the satellite 
tracking data is so detailed um, and we know what proportion of the daily fixes the bird is perched rather than flying because there's a, um, a sensor on the tag that logs whether the bird is moving or not. So it's very easy for us to determine whether the bird is perched. So that is really, really revealing. And that very much ties in with um, research that's been done around Europe, which shows that white-tailed eagles typically spend about 93% of time perched. And likewise, bald eagles, very closely related in North America, about 94% of diurnal time is spent perched. So this is a bird that very much sits quietly in the landscape and assesses where its next meal might come from. So what that means is that they've actually fitted into the English landscape very well. So whereas in the early days, people would repeatedly say, well, there's surely not space for white-tailed eagles in, in southern England. It's densely populated. They need to be in remote, wild places on the west coast of Scotland. Well, actually, the birds are finding the quiet places in England, which is really encouraging. And they're spending the majority of the time perched, so they're very inconspicuous in the landscape. Um, Local breeding and wintering birds very quickly become habituated to their presence. So if a white-tailed eagle suddenly appears at a site, well, they might well flush everything. But very quickly, those local birds will learn that the eagle is generally not a threat. It will sit quietly and they can continue feeding, just like those Brent geese and oyster catchers were doing in the photo on the Isle of Wight. Uh, carrion is important and particularly for, for, for birds in their first winter. Um, but really, throughout their lives, white-tailed eagles will take carrion if it's available, but there's a preference for live prey if, if it's possible to catch it. Um, we've been really encouraged by the fact that they're catching fish around the year, throughout the year around the Isle of Wight, so I think that really stands the population in good stead for years to come. Um, rabbits and brown hares are really important, but also this amazing dispersal. So young birds disperse up to or nearly close to a thousand kilometers from the release site before returning to the Isle of Wight. And that's why um, whether you're in Yorkshire, whether you're in um, Northumberland or Cumbria, there's a chance of seeing birds from the Isle of Wight just about anywhere in England because these dispersal flights will just literally take them across the country. Um, and the overriding feeling we've got is that people are really excited to see this bird back in the English landscape. You know, we're getting so much positive feedback. And I think it was particularly pertinent during the COVID lockdowns when people were actually seeing them flying over their gardens, which was just really, really exciting. And I think it's also really important that we're developing good relations with a range of stakeholders. Some of those stakeholders who are initially antagonistic, who are initially very wary of the project. I hope what they're seeing is that we're, you know, taking their concerns seriously. They've got a stake in the project and they're, you know, they're feeling involved. And I think that that is an absolutely integral part of any successful reintroduction project. And to be honest with you, any successful conservation initiative, full stop. And we're very grateful for all the support we've got from those different people. So um, I tried to keep that to 50 minutes. I think I just about have. Um, if you've enjoyed that, then if you have a look on our website, roydennis.org, then there's more um, on the project there, including some of these exploratory flights that I've um, detailed. I mean, obviously, we have to be careful about re revealing certain locations just because of the sensitivity um, of the birds, but also you know, um, different land use in the places they visit. But um, I hope that in years to come, this is a bird that's going to become more and more familiar with people across England. And well, we've already seen they've taken a liking to Yorkshire. So I'm sure that there'll be plenty more sightings of Isle of Wight birds in Yorkshire um, in the years to come. But yeah, thank you very much for listening. Tim, thanks ever so much for that. That's uh, just wonderful. And uh... Excellent timekeeping, thank you as well. We do have some questions. A few people have put them in the chat so far, which I've picked up. If you could keep them in the q and it's just easy for me to keep track of which we've asked and which we haven't, please. Um, but Tim, the first one, uh, you mentioned first winter can be a difficult time for juveniles. What's the most common cause of mortality in that period? Um, well, there's a few things. So they, it can be um, anthropogenic. So, I mean, we lost one of the 2020 birds because it flew into a power line because you can imagine that they're pretty naive in that first year. And so if you look at Europe, then things like collisions with power lines, trains, um, wind turbines are quite, are quite a common cause of death. So for a young, inexperienced bird, that's a, that's a risk. 
but also just not being in very good condition. There was another bird that died in its first winter where there was no real definitive cause of death. Um, and it probably was that it just wasn't feeding very well. And that's why this year we're really pleased that those birds in their first winter have found, you know, are continuing to come to the release site. Because what it means is that in that first winter when they're not, you know, they're not really very adept at catching live prey, if they're struggling to find carrion in the landscape, then they may well not survive. But because they're coming back to the food we're providing, then it should mean they're in really good condition and they're more likely to survive. Thank you. Um, you've mentioned a lot and shown the charts of birds moving all the way across England and up into Scotland. There didn't seem to be any traces in Wales. Is that just sort of a low sample size or is the reason they're not headed there? I, I, I don't know. I think part of it could be to do with prevailing winds, because when you look at the, the initial dispersal flights, they typically make the really long ones when they've got a tailwind. So if you think about southwesterly winds, the southwesterly being the prevailing wind direction in, in England, um, when they're making these initial flights, they typically end up in, in kind of heading northeast. So from the Isle of Wight, that might take them into West Norfolk. It might take them up to the North York Moors, as, as we've seen. And so that could be a reason they're not going to Wales. I mean, there's no doubt that Wales is perfectly suitable for white-tailed eagles. Um, I think it's just a relatively a combination of, you know, the fact they're probably influenced by the wind in these initial dispersal flights, and also just the fact it is a relatively small sample size. So I think we will see more birds going to Wales in the future, but just not not at present. Well, they can keep coming to Yorkshire first. <laughs> <what I'm concerned. laughs> um, A couple of comments raised about the prevalence at the minute of avian flu around a lot of the, the country and sometimes in areas that have that had sea eagles later than others. Um, is there a concern that it might pass to the to the birds or yeah, there anything is actually, you can do around that? There's nothing we can do, unfortunately, but um, it is a it is a concern because there was a sea eagle found on the Isle of Skye um, in November, which had a post-mortem which was found to have died of avian flu. Um, and another one in Ireland and the problem is is that because they are scavengers if they feed on a carcass that's got avian flu then it can be transmitted to the bird so it is it is a risk um, um, and, and the problem is is that you could lose quite key adult birds to avian flu so that happened in Ireland a few years ago where breeding bird was lost because it contracted it so there's not much we can do about that. That's natural mortality that occurs throughout Europe. Um, but that's why releasing enough birds is important because inevitably some birds will be lost to natural causes in that way. So yeah, um, we have to hope in these early years when there's a small number of birds that that doesn't happen, but not much we can do about it really. And I'll just acknowledge a couple of the questions people have put on about sort of declining rabbit numbers. Could that be a concern? Um, yeah, it's not um, great, but there, there's about another 10 questions, Tim. So unless you've got a yeah. really quick view on that, I'll skip on to. Um, I mean, the birds, yeah, it, it could be an issue. But I mean, I think because they can switch diet according to whatever's most seasonally abundant, they're not dependent on rabbits. It's just that that's a good food source in areas where they're abundant. So it's not necessarily a worry, but clearly it is a worry in the wider sense. And then the last one about, uh, I think, food sources before uh, perhaps we go on to you know, other places, uh, other geographic uh, aspects. Um, you mentioned seeing little evidence of lambs in the diet so far. Is that perhaps more because sheep, sheep farming isn't so prevalent in the regions where the eagles were, or could it I, be more I think, prevalent? I think the fact is that in southern England, there's a huge, well, throughout England, but particularly in southern England where the project's based, there's a really high availability of natural prey. And in areas where there is high availability of natural prey, there's no evidence of conflict with livestock farming. Um, the situation in Scotland is obviously potentially different, but I think that the, the situation is clouded by the fact that in those areas, um, a lot of lambing occurs outdoors on the hills and white-tailed eagles scavenge carrion. So, you know, even a white-tailed eagle carrying a lamb has not necessarily killed it. And that's the research that's been done so far suggests that in the main, that's what's happening. They're scavenging carrion or they're taking non-viable lambs. So um, it's not something that we ex we hope it won't be a problem in southern England because of the natural prey availability. Because, you know, at times when the birds will be breeding, when they've got the highest um, need for food, then, you know, species like grey mullet are going to be favoured. And because their abundance is high, 
we really expect that there won't be that that conflict. I certainly hope that's going to be the case. Um, but obviously, it's something that we're we're monitoring. There have been no issues so far whatsoever, so no evidence of any problems. Thank you. I say moving to some of the more geographic uh, aspects. There's a few people asking, and I don't know if you're able to comment about the Wild Ken Hill project yep. and what's what's the position with that. Yeah. So unfortunately, that's not. This is for those that don't know. Yeah, um, so a license has been granted for that, but Wild Health Kenhill um, have taken the decision that they don't want to proceed at present. Um, so we're kind of re rethinking what might be possible in West Norfolk. We still think it's a really good area for white-tailed eagles, and that you know that's you know born to, you know is evidenced by the fact that I think six of the Isle of Wight birds so far have spent prolonged parts pr prolonged time periods in West Norfolk so I'm talking you know periods of months rather than days um, and in terms of restoring the population then it would make sense for that to be kind of the second phase of the English reintroduction so we still think that it would be valuable to do it there um, and we're kind of keeping an open mind and potentially thinking about where else something could take place so um, it's disappointing it can't go ahead at Ken Hill at the moment but that's you know that's a decision they've taken which is fine um, and the right thing for them at the moment. So we'll just see how, how things progress. And what sort of factors do you consider when you're looking at new release sites? And, and I'm sure you can tell this is all headed to where, when can we get one in York? <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, the, the thing you have to remember with a release site is it's not necessarily where the birds are gonna breed. So, um, you know, the site that we've chosen on the Isle of Wight is not where all the white-tailed eagles are gonna end up nesting, um, far from it. What you need is somewhere quiet where the birds aren't going to be disturbed where there's probably some woodland um, you want to be ideally near um, some good fresh water or salt water habitat because obviously that just facilitates the birds or it replicates the birds natural nesting sites so the requirements are actually relatively simple but it just needs to be in a strategic location it needs to be somewhere where if you think that they might settle within 50 kilometers of that site are there sufficient numbers of areas with good breeding habitat where a population could become established um, and then it's also important to consider potential ecological impacts if you know this is a native apex predator so it should be in the landscape but are there any issues with releasing it in a specific site so that's the kind of thing that you have to consider um, as you go forward so yeah okay thank you there's a, an interesting one here of uh, somebody who says their father was sure he saw a white-tailed eagle in Warwickshire in the 1950s if that was right presumably it must have been a continental bird on it yeah i mean that in the 50s in warwickshire that would be very very rare um because at that time even the continental population was not nowhere near what it is now because they they were really badly affected by ddt um in europe so it's it's possible but um yeah i guess a wanderer from probably continental europe mm. I was struck by how rarely they they crossed the sea and and then you came on just to that one because all the trails until then were very much get to the coast and stop yeah would, i mean would that, that bird that crossed have got high enough that it could see where it was gonna land yeah i think so i think the thing is because they're such a big heavy bird you know they're they're very much dependent on using thermals when they're moving across the landscape you know they're trying to minimize energy expenditure so it's actually quite risky to cross an area of open sea so when it flew across from Dungeness, it got so high, it was over 3,000 feet, you know, that it would have definitely been able to see the French coast and the altitude just slowly dropped as it got across to France. Um, when it came the other way, actually, it started off at lower altitudes. It was only about 300 feet. But obviously it had this really, um, it had a favourable tailwind, which would have helped. And I guess that gave it the confidence to go across. But the fact that bird previously had come to the coast three times seemingly in an effort to come across back across to England but then turn back it must have been making a judgment that the weather conditions weren't quite right so then it just went back to the Netherlands went back to its favoured spot in the Netherlands and then gave it a few weeks and came back again so it's fascinating Amazing, to see how, it? they, how they behave yeah and then the last one um maybe not sea eagles yet but has the Roy Dennis Foundation plans for any reintroductions in Yorkshire anywhere even if you can't be specific um, well, not at the moment, but obviously we're always open minded to new ideas and suggestions. Um, you know, I think that, you know, I think what, we, what we've seen with the white-tailed eagles so far is that they they have gravitated towards Yorkshire. 
Um, so I'm sure that you're going to see more of them in the years to come. So, yeah. So, I mean, if anyone's got any thoughts or ideas, then by all means, get in touch and we'll be happy to discuss stuff. Yeah. Lovely. I think I think you'll be hearing from some of us. Too. That's great. <laughs> Well, thanks ever so much. And thanks to everyone that's asked questions. I think I've got through most of them there. We did get loads. So sorry, I couldn't get to all of them. But hopefully you've kind of got either directly your question or or something related has been asked. Um, thanks to both Wharfdale Naturalist Society and Yorkshire Rewilding Network for organising this evening. Um, the next Wharfdale Naturalists presentation is two weeks time. Um, it's Tuesday, the 20th of December, uh, 12 Plants for Christmas by our own Ian Brand. And the next Yorkshire Rewilding Network webinar will be the 19th of January with Tim Tom covering the work of the Yorkshire Peat Partnership. Um, both organisations are growing and thriving at the minute. Wharfdale Naturalists has a very modest £12.50 annual subscription. Um, you can get more details from the wharfdale-nats.org.uk website and Yorkshire Rewilding Network, as John mentioned at the start, is always grateful for donations to keep us going um, through yorkshirewildingnetwork.org.uk and particularly we're trying to get people to join our Wild 100 Club. But um, unless John shouts suddenly that I've missed everything, thanks to John for the intro, but especially thanks to Tim. Um, we've had record numbers on this webinar for either Wharfdale Nats or, uh, or Yorkshire Rewilding Network. And I think that's testament both to the subject matter and the quality of Tim's talk. So thank you very much. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. That's us for this evening.